Uh, Judge, if I could begin with you. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the jury instructions and how central they are to how the jury will decide this case because the judge has some influence on defining for them the terms, in effect, and giving them a roadmap for deciding guilt or innocence. Why? Tell us why they're so central. Well, jury instructions are a road, mm -hmm. are definitely a roadmap. And, of course, jurors pay very careful attention when a judge speaks mm -hmm. happily. Mm -hmm. And so they do want to get their information from the judge. They'll be paying careful attention. Essentially, I would say probably 80 or 90 percent of the charge will be boilerplate. In other words, it's what you're going to hear in every other case, the presumption of innocence, the burden of uh, the burden of proof, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, credibility, and so on and so forth. In this case, there's going to be maybe a little bit longer. There are a lot of counts that they have to go through, and there's going to be some, um, some wrangling over if there hasn't been already. About there is no crime. Wall Street Journal. Jonathan Durley, a classic closing page by the lawyers is to use a physical object like a three-legged stool. If any three-legged stool is missing and any leg is missing, the stool absolutely collapses. Even a cursory review of the evidence shows that this case does not have a leg to stand on. This is a case without a leg to stand on. This is Jonathan Terrell. The case, the case against Trump should end in a very strong not guilty. Not guilty. I don't know these people but they're great legal scholars. Greg Jarrett, every defendant. And just to end, we had an election expert who was going to say everything was perfect. We had the FEC did nothing. It was fine. And we had a lot of other people. I could give you a list of 40 people that would say the exact same thing as these people said. So uh, thank you all very much. We'll see how it goes. This is a very dangerous day for America. It's a very sad day. Thank you. Are you worried about a conviction? Todd, are you confident tonight? All right. Questions shouted at him, but as usual, he does not turn around to answer them. He gave some uh, remarks. You've heard several things before, but he doesn't. Jonathan Durley, a classic closing page by the lawyers, is to use a physical object like a three-legged stool. If any three-legged stool is missing and any leg is missing, the stool absolutely collapses. Even a cursory review of the evidence shows that this case does not have a leg to stand on. This is a case without a leg to stand on. This is John Lee Country. FEC Commissioner Bradley Smith's testimony would have established that Trump cannot have willful, willfully violated FECA, that's Federal Election Campaign Act, because NDAs are not campaign expenditures. You know, there's nothing wrong with an NDA. They're signed all the time by many, many companies. Uh, they sign them literally on an hourly basis. And I'm a gay court. I'm not allowed to speak. It's a first. No president has not been allowed to speak. Questions shouted at him, but as usual, he does not turn around to answer them. He gave some uh, remarks. You've heard several things before, but he does end with this. Is it a dangerous and a dark day? In well, it's not common for uh, a prosecution. Oops. Okay, we lost Jonathan, Mc Jonathan Turley for just a moment. So, Andy no, we're, McCarthy. We're loaded with lawyers. Yeah, Andy McCarthy, if you're there, uh, I'll let you Dana, pick up can there. I, can I get this in real quick here? Uh, apologies, I'm still in bed quite sick. But that is just a word salad. Literally, what is he on about? Is it dementia? Please tell me if you have any knowledge about medical conditions, what is going on inside Trump's head? Please, comment section. If you think he has dementia, just press the like button. What do you think the top key arguments that each side needs to make as they try to sway jurors? Right. So, you know, at the end of every closing argument by a defendant, if you don't have a little bit of real um, reasonable doubt in your mind after listening to the argument, the defense hasn't done its job. And I think that's what we'll hear today from the defense when they go first. Their job is to raise questions, to poke holes in this edifice of evidence that the government constructs throughout a trial. Some of the most important arguments will center on Michael Cohen and his credibility. You know, in many ways, there's strong circumstantial evidence. We'll hear the people of the state of New York talk about that in their closing argument. 
But the defense will have a legitimate argument that if Michael Cohen isn't credible, that entire mountain of evidence is, is built on a platform that can't hold it up. Michael Cohen's credibility will be front and center in their argument. And they'll also, along the edges of that argument, point out that he was providing legal services, that these paper records don't meet the technical elements of fraudulent records. When it's the people's turn, they'll come back with this argument. They will argue that proof beyond a reasonable doubt doesn't depend on any one piece of evidence. It's all of the evidence taken together. Mm -hmm. And so they constructed an immaculate case, whereas we discussed while the trial was ongoing, they corroborated as much of Michael Cohen's testimony as they could before he took the stand. We'll hear them remind jurors of witnesses whose testimony they've forgotten. They testified weeks ago, starting with David Pecker. And this is an important process that prosecutors go through at the end of a trial. It's memory reconstruction, telling the jurors don't rely on our memory, rely on yours. But here's what happened at the beginning of this trial. And they will layer evidence upon evidence to say, you know, those holes that the defense tried to poke in our case, there are only one or two pieces of evidence deep, but there are four or five other pieces of evidence that corroborate. For instance, Donald Trump's willingness to engage in a crime that was designed to cover up or commit other crimes. At the end of the people's argument, they will tell the jury that proof beyond reasonable doubt doesn't depend on any one piece of evidence or any one witness. It depends on all of the evidence built together and that there's too much here to ignore. Strong direct and circumstantial evidence of Donald Trump's guilt. So, well, here we go. This is the biggest moment of the trial. This is when the parties get to stand up and make their closing arguments directly to the jury. Now, the defense will close first. That is the way it works under New York law, like it or not. And so we will hear first, the jury will hear from Todd Blanche, Donald Trump's lead defense lawyer. Blanche is a longtime former federal prosecutor. He's given high stakes prosecution closings before, but of course, nothing quite like this one. Look for Blanche when he gives his closing today to stress the theme of the burden of proof. Like many defendants, he will argue this is not about who has a better story. This is about whether the prosecution has carried its burden of proving its case beyond a reasonable doubt. That is the highest standard in our legal system. Now, another theme to watch for, as Caitlin and Paula were just saying, is Michael Cohen. The defense is going to want the focus on this guy and not on this guy. They're going to argue you cannot trust him. You cannot find proof beyond a reasonable doubt based on Michael Cohen. Specifically, the defense will remind the jury that Michael Cohen came out at, in trial, has a long history of lying. He has lied to Congress, to the Justice Department, to the Federal Election Commission, to the IRS, to various banks, to a federal judge, and to the media. Also, look for the defense to argue that Michael Cohen has lied on the stand in this trial. For example, the incident when Michael Cohen testified about an important phone call he had at 8.02 p.m., on October 24, 2016, with Keith Schiller and Donald Trump. That's what Cohen said on his direct testimony. On cross-examination, it came out that the texts before and after this call were about something different. They were about a 14-year-old who'd been sending harassing text messages to Michael Cohen. Watch also for the defense to remind the jury, Michael Cohen is extraordinarily biased. He hates Donald Trump. Michael Cohen's own words, I truly hope this man ends up in prison. The insults, Cheeto dusted, cartoon villain and similar sentiments from Michael Cohen. The argument will be, how can you trust someone who's dead set on setting the defendant to prison and look for the defense to remind the jury, Michael Cohen has a financial motive here. He's made millions, the testimony showed from his books, Disloyal and Revenge, from his podcast, his TikTok, and from his merchandise. Now, look for the defense to focus on the specific elements of the crime. There's really two big ones. The first one is falsifying business records. And the argument that I think the jury's going to hear is that there is evidence that Michael Cohen and Alan Weisselberg were in on this plan to reimburse Michael Cohen $420,000 for the Stormy Daniels payments. But the defense is going to argue you can't link Donald Trump to that plan unless you go through Michael Cohen. There's no direct link between Donald Trump and the business documents and the handwritten notes. And therefore, the defense will argue you can only get there if you trust Michael Cohen. Also, of course, the defense will remind the jury Michael Cohen stole from Donald Trump. He admitted it on cross-examination. He stole $60,000 in the course of that $420,000 payment on direct exam. Michael Cohen tried to say it was, quote, self-help and he was merely rebalancing. 
the books, but he admitted on cross that he did steal. The defense will argue that shows Donald Trump did not know what was going on in this transaction. He was getting stolen from. And then the second element that the prosecution has to prove after falsifying business records is that Donald Trump acted with a campaign motive. Look for the defense to remind the jury of certain pieces of testimony, like the one we heard from Hope Hicks, that Trump was concerned about the story. He was concerned about how it would be viewed by his wife. And he wanted me, Hope Hicks, to make sure the newspapers were not delivered to the residents that morning. Unfortunately for the defense, Hope Hicks also said there was a campaign motive, as did many other witnesses. And finally, as Anderson and Paula and Caitlin were just discussing, look for Todd Blanche to remind the jury there are crucial witnesses here. Alan Weisselberg, the CFO of the Trump Board. Keith Schiller, who was part of crucial phone calls. Karen McDougal, who received a prior hush money payment. The defense will say, where were those witnesses? The prosecution could have called them, but did not. They carried the burden of proof. So look for those key themes, Jake, as we get ready to hear this closing should kick off in about 20 minutes. The stakes really don't get much higher than this. They sure don't. Uh, my panel's here.